Good morning, everyone. I am so happy to see you. We got Billy out here braving the cold with me. I appreciate the solidarity there. Aren't you glad there's no ice today? Man, I'm getting so tired of winter. We were so iced up, you know, this past week and the week before. Um, some of y'all gave me a hard time because you heard that I pulled the door handle off my car. That did happen. And I would love to tell you that in my incredible strength, I grabbed the door handle and just pulled it off as a demonstration of my power. But that is not what happened. I totally accidentally pulled it. I was trying not to pull the thing off. It's just frozen. But I learned this past week how to put a door handle on a Hyundai Santa Fe. So I can add that to my resume now. I now know how to put door handles on to the car. So thankful that uh, it is not icy today. You know, here it's here at our location in Hillsville, it is still below freezing, but it's not very windy and the sun is shining and we say, praise God. Now, it seemed like the last few years we didn't have all that much of a winter. It wasn't that severe. Does anybody else think it's trying to make up for it this year? We're getting like four winters all in one. At least we know how to drive in the winter weather here, not like in Texas. My sister lived in Texas for a long time, and I, I asked her about the snow in Texas. She said, yeah, in Texas, the only thing they know how to drive in is sunshine. Anything besides sunshine, they don't drive too well in. And Hey, God bless. God bless Texas and anybody listening to the podcast from Texas. We love you in Jesus' name. We're going to pray for you driving. Hey, fact of the matter is, People don't drive that great around here either. Not us. I mean, we're good drivers, right? We've established that. It's everybody else that doesn't know how to drive in the snow and ice and all that. It's, I'm so glad there's no ice today. I kind of hope that the weather stays good for a while. I want to get back to having live music here in our services. The, uh, the ice has messed up our practices. And, of course, it's a little tough to get the instruments out when it's below freezing. It's not too good for the equipment or the instruments, but we will get there because as cold as it has been, as nasty it has been, it's not gonna be like this forever. It's gonna get better. Sunshine like this is just around the corner. Um, we've almost made it through winter. Spring is knocking on the door. Would you believe that we are less than a month away from spring? If I read the calendar right, spring, yes, I agree, Billy. That's one of those times that we give one of those uh, Ric Flair salutes. Woo! Spring's almost here. We're less than a month away from spring. Spring starts on March 21st, I think, if I read the calendar right. I hope it's not April 21st. That just seems like so far away. So we've, we've almost made it. Now, how awesome is our God? that he has brought us through. We're two thirds of the way through winter, more than two thirds of the way. And we're gonna come out in spring and it's gonna be a lot easier, hopefully out here. If you had told me two or three years ago that we were going to be doing outdoor services all through winter, man, I would have looked at you sideways. First of all, I would have said, why? I think that's a completely valid question. Why? And we. Uh, we would not have imagined the situation we're in with the global pandemic and the restrictions that kind of make it impossible for us to be inside at this time. We would not have guessed that that was going to happen. And, uh, but here we are. I would have said, well, how, how are we possibly going to have church services when we have nothing to offer people except for a parking space and the love and the gospel of Jesus? I, I would have said, how are we going to make it work when we're outside in the cold with no real warmth and temporary shelter how are we going to make that work and i would say how are we going to get to talk to each other if we have to wear a mask but now i acknowledge the difficulty of all those things but you can't stop the gospel pandemics can't stop the gospel having to meet outdoors can't stop the gospel nothing can stop the gospel yes amen this is just another reminder to us of how good God is. That He can make it work. 
he can find ways to make it work. It's a reminder to us that a church is not a place. A church is a people. A people who love each other and stick with each other no matter what. Not just through human love, but through the love of Jesus. A church is a community of life and love, and that is who we are. That is what we are. We're finding new ways to make it work. Guess what? It's not too long until we're going to be launching our first virtual small group. Isn't that going to be fun? We'll be doing that soon. If you want to be a part of some small groups, get in touch with me. Uh, you can look on our website, recreatechurch.org, and find some contact information, and we'll work that out. The first pilot group's going to be launching pretty soon, that even though we can't necessarily be in the same close physical space as we would like to, we're going to find ways to make it work. That's exciting. You know what you can say? You can say that you were a part of it. That you stuck with us through the cold winter. You stuck with us. And when spring comes, I got to believe that the blessings are going to come with it. You know, these, these are good days. It doesn't necessarily seem like it, but these are good days because every day is good when you got God on your side. Ultimately good, I mean. I'm not saying easy. There's a difference between easy and good. I think we confuse the two. These are not easy days, but these are good days. You know what gets me excited? I'm starting to see some daffodils pushing up through the ground. Anybody seen any daffodils pushing up through the dirt somewhere? Maybe some like little flowers just barely starting to peep up? Maybe I'm imagining these things. I get excited when I start to see the first little signs that spring is coming. That's a blessing to me. I love it when, uh, when those first buds start to appear on the trees and you know life is coming back. And even though my allergies make me suffer for it, I love it when the world starts turning green again and the flowers start blooming again. It's, it's wonderful. It's a blessing to me. It's, it is that, that those first little signs that fuller blessings are coming. It's like that good sense of anticipation that you know better things are just around the corner. That's the way I feel about this time of year. It's still cold. It's very cold. I'm so glad the sun is shining today and the wind isn't blowing because otherwise I'd be pretty darn cold out here. It's not too bad right now. But as cold as it is and as nasty as it has been, it's not going to be like that for too much longer. We see the first signs of the change that is coming. And spring means time to grow things. I love to plant something and watch it grow. I love planting a garden. I'll tell you what I don't like is weeding a garden. I hate that. I love the planting part. I love the part where, where the plants come up. It's with the other plants that are not supposed to be there. They come up and you've got to pull weeds. I hate that part. I love to grow things. I love to plant tomatoes. Man, I love me some tomatoes, plant some good old tomatoes, nothing like a tomato sandwich, fresh out of your garden with mayonnaise and salt and pepper. It's a wonderful thing. Good old tomato sandwich. If you don't like tomato sandwiches, I don't know what's wrong with you, but I will pray for you with all my heart that whatever's wrong will get fixed because tomato sandwiches are the best thing. And you know when you plant a tomato, I know not, not all of your gardeners, but those of you who have ever grown a tomato plant, you know, you're watching that first one. You have an idea of the first one that's going to get ripe, right? Like, okay, that's the one. That's the one I'm going to put on a tomato sandwich. It's going to be so good in Jesus' name. It's going to be wonderful. And you're watching that first tomato, and it's, it's an anticipation, okay? All those tomatoes are going to be good, yeah, but it's that first one, you know? It's that first one that's so special because it is the sign of good things to come because you know after the first one comes the second one the third one the fourth one the fifth one and last year we had a lot of weeds but we had even more tomatoes and we made fresh salsa like every couple of days we made fresh salsa out of our garden man it was so good maybe even better than a tomato sandwich if that is even possible but there's joy in that very first fruit okay not everybody's a gardener i get that but you have the thing that you look forward to that's like the the first part of some new blessing, okay? 
if you follow something like baseball or some sport that you love, the first game of the season, that's kind of a big deal. You want to watch that season opener because this is a sign of good things to come. Most ball teams aren't playing their best ball in their first game. They're not in that mid-season form yet. But there's something exciting about the first game that makes it extra enjoyable. It's the anticipation. Let's say you're not into sports, but you, like most people in the pandemic, you've been watching a lot of TV. Maybe you got some show that's like the first show or a, of this series or the beginning of a new season. Like, oh, I really want to watch that first one. Why? Because it is the anticipation of all the other blessings to come. Or, or let's go on a better level. Let's say there is a baby on the way, maybe even like a first child or for somebody, a first grandchild. How exciting is that? Or once the baby gets here, the, the first words and the first steps. I remember when my kids were young, I coached them so hard that their first word would be dada. And it worked for the most part. And I have video evidence of that. I have it recorded for all time. And I can show my wife, see, remember when Elijah said dada first, even though you were trying to get him to say mama. But he said, Dad, how exciting is that? Now, they've said a lot of words since then, but it's something about that, that first word. Uh, maybe it's that first paycheck of a, of a hopefully better paying job that it's like, hey, that first, that's kind of nice. Hey, that's good. Yeah, I, I, that would be a wonderful thing. Or maybe let's just put it down on base level. It's that first cup of coffee in the morning, okay? That first cup of coffee when that magic bean water hits your soul and you turn from a cave troll that rolled out of bed to a human being that's ready to face the world. Good old coffee. That first one, man, that's the best one, even though I'm half awake and can't hardly enjoy it. It's nothing like that first cup of coffee. We celebrate first things on big and small scales, not just because they're, you know, the first, but because they're the beginning of more blessings to come. Did you know God gets excited about that too? God gets exciting about the first little bit of a good thing that anticipates more good things to come. God created a holiday, a, a holy day, a special occasion for His people that was about celebrating the first part of a good thing that was leading into more good to come. He called it the first fruits first fruits that's a one of the holidays that the lord made for his people now there are lots of different holidays that are celebrated across the world different people different cultures different nations have their own holidays however there are seven specific holy occasions created by god himself in the old testament for his people now as new testament believers we're not bound by those holidays. We're not expected to observe these things, but we can learn a lot from them, and we have been learning a lot from them. We started with something called the Feast of Trumpets. The Feast of Trumpets was kind of like a New Year celebration. It was a chance for the, the people to kind of hit the reset button and start the new year on a new note. We do that in our culture, right? Or we try to. We make New Year's resolutions, but even if we don't take our resolutions so seriously, there's something about us. We like the idea of kind of hitting that reset button and getting another chance. After that came the Day of Atonement. Very, very important holiday where the high priest would go into the most holy place in the temple. And we saw how that pointed forward to how Jesus would take our sins upon himself, how he became the scapegoat. That's the origin of that term, scapegoat. It's out of that story. He became the scapegoat for us. After that was the really quirky holiday called the Feast of Tabernacles, where God had his people build shelters out of sticks and plant material and live in them. They made stick forts. I would, I would love that. I didn't know that all through my childhood I was observing the Feast of Tabernacles. I just thought I was making forts in the woods out of sticks. Turns out I was already on the path of do what God wanted. No, no, probably not. I can't claim anything like that. But it's really neat. It was a reminder to them of uh, the temporary nature of this world as they lived in temporary shelters. It's a reminder to us about what is forever and what is merely for now. So much of what we treat as important in this world is just for now. It's not 
forever. Then last week we talked about the Passover. The Passover was a remembrance of, of how uh, God delivered his people from slavery in Egypt and how he did so through the blood of a lamb. It pointed forward very powerfully, maybe more powerfully than anything else in the Old Testament. It pointed forward to the sacrifice of Jesus, who is the Lamb of God, who takes away the sin of the world. If you didn't catch that message, go back and pick up the podcast, or better yet, pick up the YouTube video so you can see the demonstration I did with the, the door frame and the cross with blood on it. I think it will be worth your while to check that out. Um, while we were talking about the Passover, we also briefly touched on the next holiday, which was the Feast of Unleavened Bread. They would eat bread without leaven, leaven being like yeast, or maybe today we would use baking powder that would do kind of the same thing, make the bread rise, but they used yeast pretty exclusively back then. Why was that important? Well, because in the Bible, yeast is a symbol of sin very often. It's that little contaminant that makes everything blow up into something bigger, and we need to make sure we're dealing with the sin in our lives because it's going to grow on us. That's the thing about sin. You get a little bit in there. It doesn't take much to mess you up, trip you up. We all need to clean house. Now we have gotten to the sixth of these holidays called First Fruits. And it was a celebration kind of, of what it sounds like. The first fruits. The first of the harvest. When we say the word fruit, we think of something like apples or, or uh, grapes, but that's not what it's talking about here. This was the beginning of the grain harvest. It's all fruit of a kind. This was the grain harvest, and, and the, this celebrated the beginning right there, right after Passover. So we're going to be in Leviticus 23, 9 through 14, if you want to be finding that in your physical copy of the Bible, if you have that on hand or if you're looking it up on your phone or device totally okay for you have your phone or device out right now as long as you're engaging in the service that's 100 percent okay with me as always i don't have my physical copy of the bible out here because it'll get wind blown and rained on and everything else so i've got it printed on this nice sheet of paper and we're going to be reading leviticus 23 9 through 14. i'll be honest with y'all folks this message was a struggle it was a struggle to get this one together. It just wasn't clicking. It just I just wasn't getting it. I had some folks pray for me, for which I am very thankful. Finally, yesterday morning, it sort of clicked. And I want to tell you what clicked. Here's what clicked for me. Here's the statement that kind of pulled it together for me so I could understand what this was about. If I was to encapsulate the message in one phrase... This would be it. So if you're writing things down, write this thing down. If we will trust God with the first fruits, He will trust us with the full fruits. I want to say that again. If we will trust God with the first fruits, He will trust us with the full fruits. And i got to believe that that's going to make more sense in a little bit when we got through this. So... Let's read Leviticus chapter 23, beginning at verse 9. Then the Lord said to Moses, Give the following instructions to the people of Israel. When you enter the land, I am giving you and harvest its first crops. Bring the priest a bundle of grain from the first cutting of your grain harvest. On the day after the Sabbath, the priest will lift it up before the Lord so it may be accepted on your behalf. On that same day, you must sacrifice a one-year-old male lamb with no defects as a burnt offering to the Lord. With it, you must present a grain offering consisting of four quarts of choice flour moistened with olive oil. It will be a special gift, a pleasing aroma to the Lord. You must also offer one quart of wine as a liquid offering. Do not eat any bread or roasted grain or fresh kernels on that day until you bring this offering to your God. This is a permanent law for you, and it must be observed generation to generation wherever you live. I want to pause there and pray for us, Heavenly Father. Thank you so much that we've got some better weather today to do this. I'm so grateful for that. And thank you that we can open up your scriptures and learn about the principle of the first fruits. I, I pray you'll help us to get it in our hearts that if we trust you with the first, you will trust us with the rest. Lord, thank you for blessing us. And I, I pray that you'll open our eyes to what you want to say. In Jesus' name, amen. So in this scripture, there's quite a lot going on. 
Let's see if we can make sense of it. First of all, let's talk about the timing. We read in the scriptures, uh, knowing that that first fruits came after Passover, and we're specifically told it was on the day after the Sabbath that followed the Passover. So you've got the Passover, and then the Sabbath that follows that, and then the next day would be first fruits. Okay. Well, we know in the Old Testament, the Jews observed the Sabbath on Saturday. Saturday was their holy day. Observant Jews even now observe Saturday as their Sabbath, as their holy day. So, on the calendar, the day after the Sabbath is a Sunday. It's a Sunday. Now, I know a lot of people call Sunday the Sabbath, but that's not what it was in the Old Testament. The Sabbath was a Saturday. So, First fruits, if it fell on the first day after the Sabbath that followed Passover, it was always on what day of the week? Sunday. First fruits would have always been on a Sunday. So, take that little fact, all right? Find a little shelf in your brain and put that thing on your brain shelf, all right? Remember where you put it? Because we're going to need that. We'll pull that off the shelf in a minute. I'm going to shelve that. And it's one of these empty corners of my brain, and we'll pull that out later. Okay, so what did they actually do on the first fruits? It, off, it involved the offering of a number of different items. There was the, the animal sacrifice. I know that sounds strange to us living in 2021. It sounds so weird. Why would they do that? But that was something they could understand then. That was something that was commonly practiced. God was taking them where they were, and he's going to take them where they need to be but he's starting at their current level of understanding and that was something they understood so don't let that wig you out too much god's going to use a principle of of the shedding of blood that he's going to fulfill in jesus so we no longer have to do any of the stuff like that they also offered flour mixed with oil and some other things that sounds a little weird to us and they were specifically to offer this flour made from the grain before they had any of the grain. But the most interesting part to me, and what I want to talk about today, is this bundle of grain that they would bring to the priest and it would be waved before the Lord. Um, a bundle of grain, they called it a, a sheaf. A sheaf. Now, I am guessing that most of us do not deal with sheaves of grain on a daily basis. If your life has you dealing with sheaves of grain on a daily basis, I want to hear that story. I want to know about that. Uh, as for me, I've seen them. You know, I, I grew up kind of around farming. I've seen them, and basically what a sheaf of grain is, this bundle, it's a, a bunch of stalks of grain with the, the seeds still on it, like big, tall grass stalks basically all bundled up together, and that's a sheaf of grain. They would bring the sheaf of grain to the priest, and it would be presented. In the highly agricultural world of that day, almost everybody planted some grain. Or if they didn't, someone very close to them did. So grain was something that everyone sort of understood and was close to, and that's part of the reason God chose to deal through that. If it had happened today, he might have picked something else, but as it was, that was something everyone could sort of grasp and understand. They would plant the grain in the late fall and it would come up sort of in the, it would come to, to fruit in the very early spring. And uh, they would watch to see which of the grain was going to fruit first, which one was going to grow ripe first that they could harvest first. And what the Lord asked them to do was to take that first grain that was ready and present it to him as an offering. Okay. That sounds nice, but imagine being the people. They have been waiting and watching and taking care of this grain for months, eager for the time when they're going to have plenty of food again because through the winter they would not have had such a food supply. They would have been relying on whatever they grew the year before. And uh, the way we put it around here is the, the tater bin is about to get empty at this point. You know, they're running low. There's not a lot left or, or if you guys don't do taters uh, I don't know if y'all do frozen chimichangas or what 
but you're about to run out of frozen chimichangas you could punch you could put in a microwave you know it's getting down low so they're eager for this to come up so imagine now that they finally got some food the lord says but wait before you eat any of it i want you to make an offering that might have been tough to give some of it away before you got to enjoy any of it so because we don't deal with sheaves of grain, maybe we can kind of put it in something that we can understand, okay? I mentioned growing tomatoes. I, I like tomatoes. I'm not like good at growing tomatoes. My thumb is not a green thumb. It's a pale green thumb. I can get stuff to grow, just not real well. Um, I did not inherit the super green thumb, thumb from uh, my parents who were awesome at gardening. But I like to grow tomatoes and man, I just, so exciting. To get that first tomato but maybe you don't like tomatoes maybe tomatoes aren't your thing okay just imagine you're growing some other kind of plant that you do like and it can be a completely hypo this is a hypothetical situation so it can be a hypothetical plant let's just say you're growing a magic tree that produces full-size snickers candy bars that'd be nice you have a snickers bar tree or whatever else you like i love snickers i can't Peanuts are not very nice to me anymore. They make me swell up, but I can't eat Snickers. But if I could, this is my fantasy, and I'm growing a Snickers bar tree. So imagine that you're growing your candy bar tree, and it's coming along, and you see one of them candy bars is about to get ripe. How do you know if a candy bar is getting ripe? I have no idea. This is a completely hypothetical situation, and I haven't thought that part through. But just say it's just about ready, and you can almost taste the chocolate and the caramel and the peanuts and all that good stuff that's in the snickers bar but hey don't get hold on you can't just pluck it when it's ready let's say there's a rule that the first snickers bar on your magic snickers bar tree you have to give it away actually let's say that the first dozen or two dozen you have to give it away before you can enjoy the first one can't even taste the first one can't even try it out. You got to give them away. That would be a little tough, right? That might feel kind of like a sacrifice. Even though you know in your heart of hearts you don't really need a Snickers bar, it might be hard to give it away after you've been watching it with eager anticipation, waiting for it to get right, excited about enjoying it, but you got to give it away. Imagine how people felt in biblical times with this offering of the first fruits. They did not just feel like it was a sacrifice it really was a sacrifice this was the time of year when their food supply was at the lowest and they needed the grain it's one thing to grow tomatoes on your patio just for the fun of it or to have a little something extra but it's quite another thing when this is the food that you're counting on to live so it might be a little harder to give it away going to be a real sacrifice after months of tending their grain crops the harvest finally begins and now the lord is asking them to give the first part away what's that about to kind of bring it closer to home imagine that you've been without a job for a while and that's not something a lot of folks have to imagine it's been tough times but go without a job for a while and then you get that first paycheck when you do go back to work and you're ready to go to the grocery store, but you notice that your neighbor does not have any groceries. So instead of buying groceries for yourself, you buy groceries for your neighbor first. That sounds really noble, right? That sounds noble. And maybe we would do that. But it would feel like a pinch, wouldn't it? Wouldn't that feel a bit like a sacrifice? Like, hey, we don't really have much food either. And if we get food for this other family, well, it's going to be tough. So what's this about? Why would the Lord ask them to do this? It kind of on the surface seems unfair. After they put all this work in and they can't be the first to eat of it, they need to offer some of it first. So what was this about? Why did the Lord ask them to present the first fruits to Him? The bottom line is, it's about faith. This would really stretch their faith. In order to give away the first part of the harvest, you're going to have to have faith that the rest of the harvest was going to come along, right? you got to believe that it's coming. By offering the first fruits to the Lord, they were acknowledging that all blessing comes from Him. From giving 
back to him the first part of the harvest at the very beginning. It was a way of declaring their faith that the Lord would bless them with the whole harvest. And that is what the Lord promised to them. He said, more or less, if you will trust me with that first part of the harvest, I will bless you with the fullness of the harvest. And the overall harvest would be better and greater and more sustaining and more blessed if they would trust him from the beginning. Remember that line that I said sort of encapsulated what I wanted to say to you today? If we will trust him with the first fruits, he will trust us with the full fruits. And that is what he told them. Of course, that isn't easy. <laughs> it's not easy to trust God with the first. And our natural inclination would be to say, hey, Lord, tell you what, let's let's make some biscuits with this first grain here. And then as as the rest of the harvest comes in, can we just make you an offering after we're sort of sure that our pantry is full then we'll give some away. Let's just make sure and do first things first. Let's make sure we have plenty. Well, I hear you. And from the wisdom of the world, maybe there's something to that. But that's not how God operates. God is looking for us to trust him with that first little bit from the beginning. I can't tell you as a pastor how many times I've had somebody say to me something like, well, preacher, when I win that lottery, when I win that Mega Millions, preacher, I'm going to donate a million dollars. Build you a big old church building. And I'm thinking to myself, hey, okay, I pray the Lord blesses you so much. All right, may the Lord bless you. But the thing is, if we will not trust the Lord with our, when we have one dollar, why would he trust us with a million dollars? We're going to have to learn to trust God with the little bit he said, if you're faithful in a few things, you're ready to be faithful with many things. Why would the Lord trust us with more when we are not faithful with what we have, when we won't trust what we, we have? We need to make the decision to trust now with whatever we have now, not with the anticipation that someday later it's going to be more, we'll have more or whatever, and then, then we'll trust you, Lord, when things get better. You better trust Him right now. Look at the Scriptures there if you still have that around. In verse 10, what did he actually say? He said, give the following instructions to the people of Israel. When you enter the land I am giving you and harvest its first crops. So when this is written, they're not in the land yet. They're still living in the wilderness. They have not planted any crops. They have not harvested any crops. This is years down the line before any of this is going to happen. But he's telling them. Before you ever go in there and plant the first crop, you need to decide that you're going to trust me from the beginning. You need to establish the principle of the first roots before there's any fruit to think about at all, that you're going to trust me with that first little bit from the beginning. But it sure can be hard, can it? When you don't have much, it's a little hard to part with what you do have. It's tough to, when, when you want to control things, the little bit that you feel like maybe you have control over, it's difficult to release that. In order to have a grain harvest, they were going to have to plant seed, right? I mean, that's how it works, yeah? You want to grow something, you got to plant something. So what is it that they would plant in order to grow grain? Well, they would plant the grain itself, the, the, the kernels of grain. What else could they have done with that seed? Well, they could have ground it up and made it in a flower and, and ate it. This was food they were burying. And, it, and they're having to trust that even though they are burying in the ground something they could eat, that the Lord was going to bless it and multiply it. In order to sow the seed, to plant the seed, they could not eat the seed. They had to plant what they otherwise could have eaten. And I wonder if part of our problem in this world is that we eat the seed instead of trusting God with the seed. We eat it instead of planting it. Instead of trusting God with what little we have, we simply consume it. Hey, and let's face it, this world is not set up for people to be encouraged to be prayerful and careful 
with their blessings, it's set up to consume it. I realize this world does not teach you to trust in the Lord. It teaches you to trust in Amazon Prime who can get the stuff at your doorstep in two days or less. I, I realize we're trying to do something very counter-cultural here. But if we eat the seed, it never we never have more than we started with. So they, they had to trust God with what little they had. And instead of consuming it, they had to plant it. They had to sow it. Must have been painful. Because you put a seed under the dirt, you can't see what's happening. When I plant seeds, I always want to know they're growing. And I like digging around. Anybody ever plant like a seed in a cup or something and you like dig down in there? What you doing under there? Seed, are you sprouting yet? Because I'm so impatient, I want to see it come up. Because you really don't know what's happening under the dirt. You've got to trust that God is causing the seed to grow. Because you can plant all the seeds you want, but it's God that makes them sprout. We can't see what's going on. It takes faith to believe that a seed will come up. And then once it comes up, it takes faith to believe that the seed will mature into a full plant and, and produce fruit or produce whatever it's supposed to produce. And it takes faith to believe that after the first fruit that came from it, the rest of the fruit will follow. It all takes faith. It must have been tough for these people living in those times, knowing it's going to be very lean before this harvest comes. It must have been tough for them to plant what they could have eaten when they couldn't be sure what would happen. This points me back to Psalm 126 and this very poetic way of, of saying this. Those who sow in tears shall reap in joy. Uh, to put that plainly, those who plant what they feel they could not spare will reap in joy. He who continually goes forth weeping, bearing seed for sowing, shall doubtless come again rejoicing, bringing his, his sheaves with him. That's Psalm 126, 5 and 6. In the first fruits, it must have been tough to give away that first little bit of the blessing. To trust God with it. But the payoff was because the Lord could see they would trust Him with the first of the blessing, the first fruits, He had every reason to trust them with the full fruits. He had every reason to bless their harvest. And let me tell you what, if you trust God with what you've got, even if it's not much, He can bless it, He can multiply it, and He can make a way where there seems to be no way at all. He really can do that. That's part of the principle of the first fruits. So what is that hard thing that you need to trust Him with today? Well, living in the times in which we're living, a lot of us probably need to trust Him with our stream of income, whatever that is. These are lean times. And it seems like Expenses haven't really slowed down that much. We don't do anything fun anymore, and yet somehow it all still gets spent. We need to trust with that little bit we have. You may need to trust God with whatever you're driving right now. I feel that. You know, trust that the Lord would, would bless and keep it going. Just trust Him with it. Uh, trust the Lord with the job that you have that might not be your dream job, but it is a job. Sometimes the best job to have is the job that keeps the lights on. Can I get a witness? Yeah. Be faithful in that job you don't love and watch. God might line up something you do love. Be faithful with the little bit you do have and God has every incentive to increase it and give you something better. You know, maybe your family situation is not what you wish it was. There might be some turmoil in it. There might be some folks who are not walking with the Lord. There might be something there that maybe you can't put it into words, or if you could, you wouldn't feel comfortable talking about it. Trust God with your family situation just like it is now. Give it to the Lord. And give it to Him every day if you have to. Give it to Him every day and watch what He can do with it. Trust God with your finances like they are right now. You know, our, our tendency is to say, okay, hey, I'll, I'll be faithful to you, Lord, when my situation improves. Well, let me tell you from experience, 
Your situation is more likely to improve if you honor God from the beginning. He can, he can do things that we just cannot believe. Trust God in your marriage like it is right now. Not after things get better. Don't wait around on your spouse to straighten things out or to change or to do all that. There's only one person in this world you can control. And that person is you. And let's just face it, you've got your hands full with yourself sometimes, don't you? Yeah, I'm a handful. You're a handful too. But I can't control you. I can only control me, sort of, on a good day, with God's help. Don't worry about trying to fix somebody else. You do what you can do. You give your life, your heart to the Lord. You put your trust in the Lord and watch what He can do. Don't wait around on somebody else. Trust God with your family relationships now. Trust Him with your health now as it is. Trust God with your future now, with your hopes, with your dreams, with your regrets. Give it to God from the beginning, right now. You might say, well, hey, man, I've, it's already a mess. It's a mess. Give God your mess. He'll take it. Give God the broken pieces, the wrecked life, all that you thought you were, but you're not. All the thought that you thought something could be, but now it's derailed and broken. It's like some beautiful vase that's fallen off a high shelf and it's shattered into a million pieces. And you're never sure how it's going to get back together again. Give it all to God and watch what He can do. He can do amazing things. Trust. If it's messed up, man, give it to Him. It's never better late than never. It's not always easy to give things to God because... Pretty much every human being I've ever met has a few control issues. Not you guys, right? Maybe. Uh, okay, just me then. A few control issues. We have things that it's hard for us to let go of. We say, well, if, if I don't take care of this, it's not going to get done right. I've heard many mothers say something like this. I guess I'm just going to have to clean this mess up myself. Nobody else around here knows how to clean up anything. I see some mamas shaking their heads. It's all right, mamas. It's okay. We, The other people in your house can slowly be trained. We're slowly being trained in my household to do a little bit better. Eventually, it's going to happen. I'm going to trust in God that it's going to happen. Someday, it's going to happen. <laughs> but here's the thing. We feel like we have to control stuff because we know how to do it better. But even if we are the most intelligent, capable people on the planet... And we're probably not. We cannot compare to Almighty God who is all-seeing, all-knowing, and all-powerful. You cannot do it better than He can do it. He is more trustworthy than we are ourselves. The smartest thing we can do is put it in God's hands because He sees what we don't see. And He has power that we don't have. And as good as we might think we are, we're not the best. God is. We can trust God. Him. It might be painful, but if you trust Him with your first fruits, He'll trust you with the full fruits. Now, okay, remember back at the beginning of this message, we took a little item and put it on the shelf in our brains. Remember that, that item about the timing of the first fruits? Remember, it was the day after the Sabbath that followed Passover. We know the Sabbath was a Saturday, so the day after the Sabbath is a Sunday. We know from the Gospels that Jesus was crucified at about the time of the Passover. And we know that He rose from the dead on the first day of the week, Sunday. He rose from the dead on the day after the Sabbath that followed the Passover. So Jesus rose from the dead on the day of first fruits. Have you seen that before? He, he rose from the dead on first fruits, on that national holiday. He is the first fruits. The scriptures say he's the first fruits from among the dead. 1 Corinthians chapter 15 verse 20 says, But now Christ is risen from the dead and has become the first fruits of those who had died. You see, the festival of the first fruits ultimately points forward to the resurrection of Jesus Christ. He is the first fruits of those who have risen from death to immortality. Was he the first to rise from the dead? No. He rose people from he raised people from the dead himself, right? The apostles did. Last year we talked about Elijah and Elisha. 
who raised people from the dead. But what happened to Lazarus and all those other folks who were raised from the dead? What eventually happened? They died again. So they were really resuscitated, whereas Jesus was resurrected. There's a difference. Jesus rose from the dead never to die again. Death cannot touch him. The grave cannot keep him. Nothing can hold him back. He is the first fruits of the resurrection. But the first fruits point to the fruits to come, don't they? You see, whenever you plant a seed, it's kind of a burial, right? You literally bury it under the dirt. But it's a burial in the sense that a seed, when it's planted, dies. Not that it ceases to be alive so much as it ceases to be what it was. It's no longer the seed that it was. But when a seed is planted, it doesn't just evaporate into nothingness, into non-being. It is transformed into something new and greater. When you plant a seed, what comes up out of the ground? What grows? Not just a seed by itself. When you plant a seed, it's a, a plant that grows. A plant that can produce many more seeds. It's something so much greater than it was before. Now, it's like that for those who believe in Jesus. Mortal death is not just the end for those who have trusted in Jesus as their Savior. Even the end of this mortal life is the planting of a seed. We don't evaporate into nothingness. I know some people say, well, you're dead and you're just gone. Well, man, if I thought that, if there was no life beyond this life, I don't know about you, but I probably wouldn't behave very well. I'd be getting away with everything I could possibly be getting away with if I didn't believe there was something beyond this life. It would be that eat, drink, and be merry for tomorrow we may die. I'd just be, you know, I'd be living what I would think would be a happy life, but it really wouldn't be a happy life, especially in light of the fact that there's something beyond this life. When a believer passes away, we don't just evaporate into nothing. It's like a seed that is planted and it's going to be raised into something so much more. Jesus was the first. Jesus was the first fruits of the resurrection. But the first fruits are the promise of the remainder of the harvest to come. The first fruits aren't just, you know, you get the one tomato and it's done. No, it is the sign that there's more to come. The fullness of the harvest. The first fruits point at the full fruits. Jesus is the first fruits of the resurrected. And those who believe in him, and that's you, if you've trusted in Jesus, you are the full fruits of the resurrection. The principle of the first fruits is this that if we will trust him with the first fruits, he will trust us with the full fruits. He called upon the people in that day to give back to him the very first part of the harvest. Because he wanted to give them the opportunity to show their faithfulness to him of how they could be trusted with ever so much more blessings than if they trusted him to give to him that very first part, then he knew that he could trust them to bless them with the fullness of the harvest. Trust him with the first fruits, he'll trust you with the full fruits. So what's our story today? What are we holding back from God that we've been reluctant to trust to him? What is it? It might be different for everyone. You may know what you've been holding back from God because you're not sure you can trust Him with it. Let me tell you this. You give that to God. Whatever it is that you're afraid to give to God because you think your needs won't be met, you give it to God. Man, I could tell you some stories of stuff that I thought was never going to work, and yet somehow I said, okay, God, I don't see how this is going to work, but I'm going to give it to you, and you're going to have to do something with it because I sure cannot. I've seen Him come through time and time again and I'm not saying it doesn't get tough I'm not saying it doesn't get painful I'm not saying like that Old Testament farmer that I didn't sow those seeds with some tears in my eyes but then the joy comes later on you can trust him give him what you have in faith he can transform it and multiply it in ways that, that you wouldn't guess give him whatever you have give him your heart, give him your life give him your, give him your soul and he can grow it I'm going to give him this 
beautiful winter day trusting that he's going to grow it in the spring. And I'm giving him recreate church, trusting that the day will come when we're, we're able to resume the ministry that we're more familiar with. You know, Can't, Some of you guys haven't really got to hang out inside our building when it's nice and clean. It's, it's maybe not as straight now as it could be or should be, but it's a nice place in there. It'd be so fun when we're able to get back in there. But we're going to trust God right now with the way it is right now knowing that he can grow it. We're going to trust him with our first fruits and he'll trust us with the full fruits. I want to pray for us right now. Heavenly Father, I want you to look into the heart of everyone receiving this message, either here live in this parking lot or by way of the podcast or the YouTube video going around the world, that you'd reach into all our hearts and show us what it is we've been holding back from you. Whatever first fruit that's in there, whatever seed that's in there that we've been reluctant to release to you and trust to you. Lord, I pray that you would show us that you can be trusted and that if we will give it to you, you can bring it back multiplied. Lord, may we be people who trust you from the start with the first, with the little bit, so that you may in time trust us with the fullness. Lord, we love you. And pray you'll do great things among us, things that cannot be explained apart from you. In Jesus' name, amen. I'm so thankful for all of you who are a part of this. I look forward to the day when I get to know some of you better. That's been the wonderful thing. God has put us right out in this parking lot, which means people have discovered us coming out of Food Line or Family Dollar, one of the restaurants, and say, hey, let's go see what that crazy guy waving his arms around is all about. And have stuck around. I look forward to getting to know you better. God bless you guys. We do this every week, 10 a.m. and 5 p.m. And on weeks when the weather is not permitting, which it has to be pretty bad, we'll have uh, the recorded message out there for you all. God bless you all. Catch you next time.